Well, it's my pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Romy Hall. Uh, Romy joined the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation in 2014 as its Healthy Neighborhoods Manager. And in this role, Romy is the lead project manager for the implementation of the San Pablo Area Revitaliz Revitalization Collaboration, a partnership of organizations, institutions, and residents working together to co-create a healthier, safer, and more vibrant community and economic and residential corridor in three neighborhoods within West Oakland. Romy holds a Master in Public Health from Drexel University and a BA in Journalism from, let's hear it now, go Wolfpack, let's all howl, from the University of Nevada, Reno. Yay, Romy. Um, please join me in welcoming Romy for an inspiring presentation that will share best practices on how we, as community partners, can influence the Truckee Meadows to be healthy. Romy. Thank you, it's just so great to be here. Let me get this adjusted, did I? Okay, there you go. Um, in Reno, and um, I am a Wolfpack member, proud. I bleed blue forever and forever, <laughs> even though I'm born and raised in Las Vegas. So, uh, <laughs> go Wolfpack. So, um, with that, it's just really an honor to be here to share with you today about the work that's happening in Oakland, where I'm from now, or live now. Um, and so um, what I thought, since you all are kind of coming up on a planning process, and just to kind of share a little bit about um, who is the East Bay Local Development Corporation, how are we working in partnership with many um, folks across sectors to implement a healthy communities initiative, healthy neighborhoods initiatives, we do place-based work. Um, and then to share what that looks like in action, both in planning and through a small win strategy that we're implementing now. Um, and lastly, just some key uh, lessons and things to think about. So, and I just wanna say we're only a year and a half in, so we are just a little bit ahead of you all. So I think hopefully you'll see today um, that the inspiration will be that partnership actually does work. It's really hard, <laughs> um, but things can happen. So, uh, so with that, I'll get started. Um, so just really the beginning frame that we have to start with in our understanding is that our health, not just mine, not just in Oakland, you all here in this room, and as well as in the zip code 89502, that our health is really based in the neighborhoods, and it begins where we live, learn, work, and play. So you both see the organization I work for, the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. We've been around for 40 years. We started in the Asian community in Chinatown in Oakland. Um, 40 years ago, and at that time, it's interesting how um, history repeats itself at the time, um, and now we're experiencing it today with, in the Bay Area with some of the great wealth that is coming in, and it's really impacting a lot of our neighborhoods, particularly in West Oakland and in East Oakland. Chinatown, the community was getting encroached on, and so, and there was a worry about um, the cultural preservation of the community, so a group of graduate students banded together and started a resource um, center um, for, uh, for Asian culture. And then from there, realized um, it was not just Asian, and so really expanded and um, work now on behalf of all um, diverse communities within the East Bay. And also as part of that, in listening and expanding our work beyond the Cultural Resource Center, started to look at housing. So 30 years ago, we started to do affordable housing as community developers. Today, we own over 26 properties. We own and manage over 4,000 units, affordable housing units. We have, um, we're the largest um, in the East Bay of 3,000 square feet of economic retail space that we have provided for nonprofits, um, organizations, and small businesses to get their fit on the ground. Um, so you might be wondering, you're an affordable housing developer. You do community development. Why are you even talking about health? Like, that was kind of um, a really, I think, I'm a public health person, so why would I work at an um, affordable housing developer? Why would a developer look at this? Why would you think about this? Well, this is really why. In 2010, our public health department came out with a report, um, and they found through doing research that in the neighborhoods where largely our properties are invested, there's a 14-year life expectancy difference amongst children. That children are more likely to be born into poverty, they're born prematurely, hospitalized for preventative diseases, 
And what that really, really says, it's not about the people, it's about what's happening in the place. It's about that root cause upstream stuff that happened that has enabled these conditions for kids to live 14 years less than any other child, um, particularly children who live in the suburbs of Oakland. So what that means is that we really looked at and said affordable housing is not enough. And it also means that health care is not enough. It also means that education is not enough. It means that having to look at a holistic approach and look at the social determinants of health of what's really going to create a healthy neighborhood. So we really kind of took a look at that time. Uh, this was in 2010, and we've adopted a strategic plan where we're piloting this healthy neighborhoods as our approach of how we do business and how we do work, and really thinking deeply about what makes a community whole and healthy. But we can't do it all. That's not the point. We can't do all of this. We can't work on arts and culture and green space. We may touch some of that, but it also calls on us to look deeply, what are we really good at and what can we really anchor in on what we do and how do we partner? So we're really good at developing housing, we're really good at building wealth, and we're really good at economic development. But we have to do that in partnership, and that's the really key thing here about breaking down the silos. And we have to work in partnership with not just um, not just with, with residents and with um, community-based organizations, we have to also work with institutions. And so collective impact is our methodology for the way that has brilliantly been um, gone over. So, um, so that's how we are working with folks. So you could see we are very multi-sector. We're working with other affordable housing developers. We're working with um, Sutter Health, we're working with which, is a, with, which is one of our hospital systems. We're working with La Clinica, the Fed, the city of Oakland, around this healthy neighborhoods approach. And we're doing it in two neighborhoods. So we're right now a year and a half in in West Oakland, and that's the project I directly manage. And we're also doing this in another neighborhood. And our goal is to scale up over the next five years and create a healthy neighborhoods in every neighborhood in Oakland, where we invest, where the city invests, where our partners invest. So I'm gonna dive deeper now into um, the work that I manage, and it's a San Pablo Area Revitalization Collaborative. Um, just to kind of point out where West Oakland is, so um, this is Oakland on the left, and then the Peach is, is West Oakland. On the other side, a four minute transit ride is San Francisco. The reason why I bring that up is because San Francisco, um, I don't know if you've heard, but it's, it's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> it is so expensive. Um, can you imagine $3,000 just to rent a one-bedroom apartment or a studio. That's how expensive San Francisco is. Um, I, uh, that's just insane. So just imagine how much money you have to make to afford that and what those opportunities are like. So West Oakland is only a four-minute transit ride, which now, over the last few years, we're in a housing crisis. So a one-bedroom would used to go for like a thousand, which I know is expensive. I know. <laughs> um, but now is going up for 2,000, 3,000, et cetera. It's on the way up. And West Oakland is really the first transit stop until you get to the city. So what we're really finding over the last few decades there has been just a lot of change in the community. And also the community has been highly disinvested. It was once a thriving neighborhood, um, af largely African-American, and then over the years has been declining. And now with this rebirth and all this wealth coming from tech industries and such, is that we're seeing a really um, big shift in what's happening. And so our focus is around three census tracts, so um, three census tracts and three neighborhoods in West Oakland. And what we're really looking to do is really to stabilize and equitably co-create healthy, safe, vibrant, and resilient neighborhood. And equitably is really important because we really want to make sure that our work is driven by the people who live there, the long-term residents, and that our revitalization work is not creating a new place for people to come and live. And that's, I think, an important frame when you're doing this work, revitalizing a community. You're not wanting to make it better for somebody else. So we're really working for long-term residents. And that resiliency is that neighborhoods are dynamic and change and how are residents and people and the institutions and organizations in those places changing with it. So our approach, we have sort of a, a, a three-prong approach where we really look at the data of what's happening in the place in the neighborhood. We look at moving forward action together and making change. And this is an iterative process that we keep on cycling through back and back and over and over again. But what really brings and drives all of that is the result. What are we looking to achieve together? What is driving us forward? And how are we going to move? 
So I'm going to start just with the result first and kind of break down in our planning process what this looks like. So with the result, we brought together, so we bought C, the organization I work for, we have two roles. We're both an implementation partner and we're also the backbone support for the whole collaborative. So that's my job. I'm full time on this um, backbone support. So something that you might really want to look at, you really need somebody to manage the process. You really need somebody to communicate. You really need somebody to facilitate. You really need somebody, um, and it can be somebody or an organization to really hold that. That's really important and that's what I think helps really drive the collaborative to move forward. Um, so the result, we decided to pilot this work in, in, um, in West Oakland, and we had been working with partners for a long time in silos. We work with this partner and this person, this resident group in here, and so brought, brought everybody together. And so the result that we really agreed and wanted to work on is that, yes, we all wanted to work on this healthy neighborhoods vision. It wasn't just Seapalti, it was everyone at the table. And who was at the table included the City of Oakland, the Public Health Department, the Federal Reserve Bank. It also included local community-based organizations, Lifelong Medical Care, which is a FQHC healthcare partner, and then also um, neighborhood residents as well. And so we all agreed to the result. The next thing that we did was look at data. And I think our concept of data, data is really, really important. I can't stress it enough. Um, and I, but I think sometimes we get in this like, we need data, and like big data, and no. <laughs> you, I think it's important, but you've got to also think bigger and data. And I think what's really exciting when, you, um, when the chip process was laid out, thank you, um, was that looking at community voice and surveys and really finding out what is it the people in the neighborhood want and really lifting that and bringing that forward. What is the history? What's the root causes? What's the story behind the trend? Why are we seeing it here? And really sitting in that and really understanding that because if you don't understand the history or how, how the conditions have happened, you're not gonna really get in there deep enough to really make change happen. Looking at maps. So one of the things that we did in bringing together, we had a big room and we did maps of everything, census tracts. Um, we looked at like hotspots in the neighborhood. We looked at health, we looked at education. We looked at the diversity of the neighborhoods. Where are our, our neighborhoods? Where are mostly renters um, versus homeowners? We looked at the city, we looked at state, we looked locally. We took in all of this data and then we used that big fan, determinant areas that I showed earlier, and said, what are the areas that we can make a difference in? But also an important part of your data is looking at the assets. What does the community already have? What are the bright spots? What are the stories? What is already working there? Because every community, no matter what you are, every, something's working in there, and you gotta figure that out, and you gotta lift it up. But also another piece of the data, who's at the table? And what can you move forward together? That's a really important data piece because you can't do it all. We don't have time to do it all. We have to do it now. And so what are the pieces that you can bring forth together? So once we looked at the data and we took time processing the data and we had, we had an overarching steering committee and then we had uh, work groups. And so then we put together an action plan. And our action plan, it's really bold <laughs> for a place-based neighborhood initiative. We, we're looking at housing like you all are. We're looking at community, and by community we mean blight reduction um, and resident power. We're looking at health and we're looking at economy. So we really took a look at taking in all that data and thinking about, okay, what are all the things that we're doing here at the table that we can mutually reinforce and make it happen here in this place in a meaningful way? So housing, we're looking at um, how do we build more affordable housing, but how do we also create a more mixed income community because our community, um, it's largely, um, it's wealthy or it's very poor. And how do we have that middle income that's also an important driver, economic driver in the community. Community, we have a lot of um, blight and illegal dumping that's historically from the community being disinvested. So what are ways that we can quickly think about a long-term strategy about making change and making the community more vibrant and also making sure that all of in our community work, making sure that residents are partners and they're co-creating and moving this action forward in the way that they want to see happen. Health, we have a particular focus on high blood pressure. So that was number one in our community surveys above and beyond everything else. Um, and so, and it was also something we knew that we could do something about really quickly if we all work together. Um, even though medication does, does, it makes a big difference, but we also believe doing some of the other pieces um, are important around 
food access and grocery stores and all these pieces, um, getting exercise, et cetera, making your community more safe to feel comfortable to exercise, and economy. We are 1.5 mile stretch of a corridor that doesn't have a lot of business. And so what are the new business opportunities and micro enterprises that we can help support residents in the neighborhood lift up, as well as getting connected local jobs and getting um, folks connected to good paying jobs. So that's our focus. But I think the last piece is that I really want to bring the important piece of all of this. These are our four core components, housing, community, health, economy, but partnership. How are you tracking what you're doing? How are you raising the funds of what you're doing? And the one thing I will say, we are low cost, no cost, so we're really trying to be scrappy with it and get done what we can get done. <laughs> but it does take money. We are like, we're pretty, we're pretty scrappy. I'm pretty proud of us. I'll show you in our example coming up. Um, it's really important. And so by low cost, no cost, it's going to take money. I mean, affordable housing, it costs millions of dollars, so you're going to have to raise that, raise that money. But it's about aligning and bringing together what you can do. So if you've got You've got this going on, you've got this going on, you've got this going on. How can we bring it all together under the umbrella? And how does it help you think about the funds that you need to raise to make that bigger and better? And then the last thing is recruiting partnerships. All of you are here today, so you're all going to be an important piece in making this happen. So um, keeping that in mind, and you've got to go recruit your friend and your best friend and that person at the bar too. So. Um, <laughs> So lastly, I just want to show you how it's all come together for us. And taking a look at the data, we started with the result. We wanted to co-create this neighborhood together. We did a lot of data gathering over a lot of time. We built our action plan. And behind that action plan are a lot of deep strategies with results, metrics, and everything. And the change we wanted to see is actually our theory of change. And so the theory of change, I'm just going to turn around a little bit. Yeah. So um, the theory of change is new. We just endorsed this and adopted this. And what this really shows, it shows our outcomes. This is what we want to achieve. And we want to achieve it in five years. So we know that health, it takes a long time. But we are really being ambitious and bold on what we're doing. And behind each of these outcomes, there are deep strategies, deep results, deep partnerships that are going to be driving all of this work. The other thing I want to just say and point out, this work reinforces the social determinants of health frame that if we are going to have healthy residents, we have to have healthy partnerships, and we have to have a healthy infrastructure for community to thrive. And all of that interacts together. So even though we're working on housing, economy, um, uh, community, and health, all of those add up, and all of that work is what's gonna drive health in this place. So that's what we're focused on. So how that looks like in practice, that is an ambitious agenda right like I'm like sometimes like oh my god what are we doing um, but how we're gonna do that is with small wins and I cannot tell you the importance of small wins and making your wins visible to really move forward so one of the things are our result what we wanted to do and we wanted to be more asset based in our language we wanted to increase the number of friendly inviting spaces within the neighborhood by 25 percent that's our goal over the next five years and so we went and we pulled together a work group, and our work group is largely residents that's focused on, they're called Spark Community, um, but um, they're our blight reduction group and volunteer resident leadership group. And the focus that they wanted to do was called the wall of graffiti. So you can kind of see here, this doesn't even do it justice, like imagine that and then two more times, there's just a wall of graffiti. So the data that we use, so in, in Oakland we have this app called C Click Fix, and you can use your phone and anytime you see illegal dumping, anytime you see um, graffiti, vandalism, et cetera, you just take a picture and it uploads to our public works department. And in theory, and most time it, it does work, the public's work department does go out and fix that. But this, as you can see, all the little pink spots are like the hot, hot spots. And you can see that um, here is, is a pink spot. So this. Wall of Graffiti was like a pink spot. It was a top hot spot um, for, um, for being reported on for years. And so then the other part with the community voice, if you see in the corner, is that we heard anyone who can figure out the wall, they deserve hero status. So we're like, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do the wall. We're gonna take it on. This is the scrappy part <laughs> that I talked to you about. So we partnered and hosted a series of events. So. Um, not only are we working on this one spot here in the neighborhood, we're also working on four other spots. And so how we came up with those spots, we took in community data, we looked at C-Click Fix maps, we looked at the, we mapped out the, um, the, the crime data, and then started with the work group 
comparing it down to identifying 10 hotspots. From those 10 hotspots, we did this big community walk and brought out like 30 people to come and walk the neighborhood and see what are, how do we take these 10 spots and narrow them down to five? And the work group came up with a criteria. So we went on this big walk. So on the picture on the left, that shows, um, yeah, on the, on the left, okay. Um, shows um, on the walk and so in front of the wall. From that, once we picked the five spots, we held this um, design dash day, which is a shred day. And what a shred is, it gets you design thinking day to take a look at those spots and think differently about that space. What do you imagine? What do you dream of? What would you like to see here? And how do you make that happen? So what came up from that shred day, we did four other spots. Um, is to do an Oaktown family tree. So to do this tree and then also collect historic and current family photos to really show where the history of the neighborhood was. And the great thing about who came up with this were the seniors of the neighborhood, some of the seniors of the neighborhood, and also some of the youth of the neighborhood. And then it was like, well, we have to show the families too and show how the diversity in the neighborhood changed. So then after that, we started to move forward with action. And for each of the groups, we only gave them $500. So um, $500 is not enough to do the wall. So uh, we thank Home Depot, we thank others who donated um, paint to this wall. So you can see people here of all ages. We had about 40 people come. It was a three week process um, for the wall. And we actually were able to find a local um, graffiti artist to work with to help set the frame of the wall to the right. And during the process, so um, we learned a lot and it talks a lot about turf. And so we had somebody tag on our wall, don't touch the other side of the wall <laughs> that had like a really big um, group tag, which, you know, you could at that point say like, oh no, you didn't. And I'm gonna go tell you, I'm gonna go touch that wall. Or you could take the opportunity and figure out with that, with that graffiti group and like think, you know, globally here, how do you reach across the aisle? So we found their hashtag online and we wrote them come help us come help us with this wall and they did <laughs> so uh thank you <laughs> so i just think that's a, a life lesson as well just to think about you know i think we think all these things about different people different organizations and how do you reach across that aisle and find their hashtag and say how do we work together so in the end the change that we wanted to see um, there's been, and this is really, you know, we're not talking about outcomes right now. We're talking about inputs. We're talking about the very beginning and, and what changed, like changing the concept of change is that there's been no tagging on the wall. This was, this was last week that I put this for two weeks. It has been three weeks, which is huge. Um, thank you. And so the other exciting thing is, um, and we're still, we've got one little piece left to do on the, on our tree, but um, this really is a community collaboration. We've had different artists come with different abilities and different experience come to this wall. And it's been really incredible to see the families who are on the wall or individuals on the wall just come up and walk by. And this is what the resident ownership and one more friendly space at a time. So um, one resident of the neighborhood that we took a picture is well known and has um, um, severe uh, mental health um, issues and so we asked to take his picture and we put him up on the wall and happened when we were working on the wall he actually walked down the street grabbed somebody off the street showed him <laughs> his picture and we're like hey tell us about your picture how does it make you feel and he said i look so handsome and we just like melted so i mean that's the kind of community ownership that we're looking at having people stopping by but taking that one little act this is a small short win and how do we build off of it so now we're really looking at the opportunity to anchor the space expand and people are dreaming in new ways how do we show bigger pictures those portraits are too small how do we make it bigger how do we do this how do we do that how do we get that business up and going how do we do this and it's really sparking some new thoughts for folks um, in the neighborhood in the community and to really think differently so that's what change can look like and this is a change that's driving um, our efforts forward in many of the areas that we're working in so some overarching key lessons just to, to consider as I wrap up here. Um, be results focused. I cannot tell you the importance of being results, even down to every single little meeting that you have. What is the result? What is anchoring you? Why are you doing this? Um, and let loose. This is really important. For those of you who like logical A, then B equals C, you need, this is not for you. <laughs> let me just be honest with you. I think that's an important skill set to have, but you gotta let loose and you've gotta see what's the big picture, what's A, B, C, D, E, F, and how sometimes you may have to go to D before you get to C. 
So really letting loose and letting the process happen, but being results focused, so knowing and being clear when, that, when you are off railing, how do you come back to that result? You gotta think long and short. So we have our outcomes, we have our action plan, we have how we're moving forward, and we have small short wins built in all throughout so that we really are thinking, we have this really ambitious goal. One of our goals is re to reduce um, uh, ER and emergency rates by 5% in three years. That is so ambitious, <laughs> so ambitious. But we are starting, we're really thinking about adaptive process. So thinking we're doing a small pilot right now with about 25 residents. And it's not about really the behavior change in the residents, it's more about how our teams work together and how we collaborate and how we implement. And before we go and launch and start working with two to three to 400 residents, let's figure out and get our systems to correct, um, correct. Let's get our paperwork right. Let's get everything together before we start bouncing, before we go bigger. So really taking that time to think, what's that result? What's the long, what's our long-term outcome? And then how do these short little wins along the way, how does that all add up? Third is always keep health central. This is something that our group struggled with. Um, and really thinking about that health frame and what brings us together, especially when you're working on big things, not just sort of, I think a lot of us have that health frame of like um, healthcare and doctors, but it's really health and well-being. And so how do you think about economy, how that, can be a, how that can be a health driver? How do you think about jobs? How do you think about education? How do you think about all these things? But health is what is always keeping you together. And so one of the things that we actually had to do during our planning process, we set up four corners of the room where we put, we, it started to feel that health was getting off and pushed off to the side. So we put economy in one group, we put safety in another, um, so it was like economy in one room and then safety in another area, and then it was um, education. So we just really broke the, four, the, the room up into four and health was in the corner. And the morning we spent a lot of time talking about health and we went through our strategies and through our actions. And finally, when we came to the end of the day, we're like, we just need a gut check to make sure that we're all on health. And so our facilitator asked, okay, where do we have the most alignment? What can we, when we look across the board at all these strategies, where do we, where do we all sit? and the room all went to health. And that was a huge moment in our collaborative where it was like, yes, when you had the city of Oakland and you had the Fed and you had this person and that person, even though it might have been hard in their different silo to see the health frame, they're starting to get it at different levels. So that's really exciting. So I think that's a really big important piece to keep central. And the last piece is you gotta be bold and you gotta believe. And I'm just gonna be really upfront with you. If you don't believe, and if you don't wanna be bold, you need to go home. You need to go home. And don't let the others, don't, don't, let, don't let the others get in your way. Uh, the reason why I'm gonna tell you a story, I still work in St. Louis doing the same work, and I was talking with a funder. I was like, I'm killing it right now. I'm doing great. I'm gonna get this money. This is gonna be great. And then the funder says to me, I don't believe you. I don't think you believe in this work. And I was like, what? I do, I do. And it really made me take a step back and think and make sure the words that I was saying, I wasn't just talking, but I believed. And that's, that's really, I think, the day that really changed my life and the work that I do. Um, because if I didn't believe, I needed to go home. I needed to not be present and I needed to be bold and ready to work. And that's where we all need to be in this work. So I just share that story to really um, take that into consideration when you're doing this work, that you've got to be bold and you've got to think big like jobs. How do you get jobs? How do you do this? How do you do that to move forward? So I just want to share with you, with Ebalti, some of our healthy neighborhood success. With Ebalti and our partners, we've secured two national grants. We've gotten the um, Partners in Progress grant, which is a funding source from City Foundation, the Low Income Investment Fund, and also the Federal Reserve Bank as a partner. Um, that's really talking about community quarterbacking. So community development organizations really moving the mark, and there's 14 communities across the nation, um, and really advancing this sort of collective impact model and really driving the field in whatever the issue is in their neighborhood. So we've received that. We were one of the um, 17 awardees of the National Build Health Grant that just came out um, in the, what was that, in the summertime? Um, um, and we received implementation. So we basically applied for the funding and that was a three-way partnership between the public health department, a community-based organization, and the third is also um, uh, the healthcare partner. And the healthcare partner had to put up matching dollars and the CEO of the hospital had to sign on. 
Woo, we did it. So, uh, um, and it was great. And our whole our whole collaborative really stood behind that, and it was really um, exciting. So we're part of this national collaborative now. And we what we presented was we presented the action plan. We said, here, this is what we're going to do, and they said yes. So we are now a part of that. Another thing to consider um, in this work since we've organized. Um, and this is for um, folks in government and, and to really think about things differently and also everybody in the room to push on government. Um, we, sorry, <laughs> we, we got in the five-year consolidated plan in the city of Oakland. So that means for five years, our corridor along with another corridor in the city are prioritized for big funding. So not, not huge funding, but you know, a couple million dollars can make a big difference. And so we are prioritized now for um, affordable housing, community um, development block grants, facade improvements, economic development. So you got to think about those long-term funding sources that you can also work your way into um, to help launch. So I think one of the, the things that we're sort of thinking about our work um, at Ibalti is that grants are for research and development, but we're really interested in that sustainable funding that's going to keep long-term. So that might be a frame to consider. Um, and the last sort of two pieces are new and unexpected partners. Um, I just want to share a story with you is that um, in this last year, I think a lot of times there's been a lot of um, groups that have come in and said they're going to do things and they don't do it. So then there's a lot of skepticism and community. So you got a lot of work to prove yourself, right? Um, so in the last year, we've actually had two resident associations align with us and come on board with our steering committee, which is really um, exciting. And so they're really partnering and we're really leveraging each other. And what, what it looks like for new and unexpected partners is, I just want to share this one story, is a resident association group, um, there's new market rate housing. So this housing is going to be like two or three thousand dollars rental units, really expensive. And this community group banded together and actually shut down a neighborhood recycler who wasn't meeting up to their conditional use permit. And so now that that's going to be closing, they know that's going to directly impact those rents because now it's going to make the neighborhood. Um, more um, sort of sexy, if you will. So, um, so they are like, no, we did this. How do we get community of benefits? And how do we make sure that um, folks who are middle income and low income working poor can also get into those units, can get into some of those? So they're approaching community benefits, but they're like, we don't know what to do. So I was like, bring that to our street. Come on, bring it to the committee. Let's talk about it. And you had the city of uh, Oakland planning and housing community development. We have a housing advocacy organization, um, and even Ebaldi and others were like jumping in and talking about, well, have you thought about this? Have you talked about this? Have you done this? Have you done this? And folks got really excited, and that group walked away with not only just a plan, but they had support, and then the committee's like, we're going to support this, we're going to get this done, because if we can figure it out here, we can figure it out throughout the neighborhood. So that's what I, what I mean by new and unexpected partners and what you bring to the table. So just on a final thought, change is possible, it's real, it can happen, but you've got to listen, you got a partner, um, you got to deal with your uh, graffiti taggers, <laughs> your turf, you've got to align, build relationships, and learn from mistakes. This, this work is not easy, and I love that collective impact video. It's like two minutes and explains everything, but there's so much work behind it. I am really tired a lot. So is our partners, um, but it's all worth it because we're all in it in the same boat together. So the last thing I want to say is um, healthy neighborhood starts with you, and thank you.